Good morning. You know, I thank John, Tom, and Mark for the encouragement. We argue. So who's going to do it? No, we don't. No, we, we take turns. And actually, uh, uh, it's an honor, but it's a, it's a scary honor. And as I was trying to discern what I was going to talk about, uh, that, that's really difficult. What you want to do is you want to give somebody something that they can take through to the new year and kind of help them progress in their spiritual growth. Now, during the year when you do one, that's not as quite as difficult. It's still difficult. But this one at the first of the year is kind of hard. And I'm going to do something today that I have never, never done before. Uh, and it's two parts. And the first part is uh, I'm going to kind of review what we've heard from this pulpit this past year. So not all these words are my words. We've had six speakers from out of this area come to us and present 24 different lessons. We've had 92 lessons from these two men right here, Russ and Devin. And I'm sure there was someone else, I couldn't remember anybody else that, that, that preached during the year, but I'm sure there were someone up here, somebody else of the congregation came up here. At least 24 of those lessons that Russ and Devin presented were from men and women of old, old being dead, yet speak. Fifteen men and women from old that had something to say, something to do, and the question that was posed to us after each of those lessons, are we listening? That does not include the 92 Sunday morning Bible studies and the 40 Wednesday night Bible studies. But I would tell you this morning that those were just appetizers. Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. Those lessons will give us something to think about, but again, they're just appetizers. If we want to be filled, we have to take those thoughts home, and we have to study them, and we have to meditate upon them, and we have to read our Bibles. So what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to put some bullet points out there on the first half of this lesson of things that I picked up from what was spoken from this pulpit last year. And I hope they help you, and I hope they remind you, and I hope they'll help you go home and think about them. And, and as we prepare for this new year, when we have 14 more men and women from old that are dead yet speak, that will encourage you to meditate upon what they had to say and that we listen to what they had to say. So to begin, until we can save, give more than what was given, we can never equal or outdo what God has done for us. Grace. We had two speakers that spoke to us on grace this past year, not to say what Devin and Gruss spoke about. Grace obligates you and I to respond to God because God has a right to expect that. He made us. He created all we have, all we see. He died for us. Nothing can keep me from that grace except me. Romans talks about in Romans chapter 8 that nothing can separate us from the love of God except me. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, cast all your cares on him, for he careth for you. God loves everybody. He does not wish that anybody should lose their soul. He wants all to come to repentance. But even more so does he love those who try. Those who, who, who try to do what he wants us to do. And the question becomes, are we trying? Are we trying to do what he wants us to do? So try, try, try. That's all that God expects. And we're condemned if we stop. 
That's sobering. Jesus is coming soon. Morning, night, or noon. A good song. But if we try, quit trying, we're condemned. Walk in the light. Confess your sins, and he is just to forgive those sins. That's trying. We're going to mess up. We're going to have problems. There's going to be distractions. But those men of old talked about some of those things, which we're going to get into. Russ and Devin talked about those things, which we're going to get into. Those six men that came here talked about some of those things, which we're going to talk about. And one of the things I picked up was God does what he doesn't have to do, but from his heart he wants to do. Do, do you appreciate that? Do you understand what that says? God does what he doesn't have to do, but wants to do from his heart. In 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 10 and 11, as each one of you received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and forever. What has God given you? to be used as good stewards of his grace. Romans chapter 12 talks about the things that we should be doing, teaching, ministering, prophesying, all those things. He gave us something. The parable of the talents says that we all have something that we can do. What's he given you? What's he given me to be used as good stewards of his grace? But one thing he gave us all, he gave us the gospel. He gave us a way back to him because we've all sinned and come short, Romans chapter 3. So he gave us the gospel, a way to come back, a way to be reconciled. Now the question becomes, are we going to give it to those who have not yet heard it? We've talked about evangelism all year long. That's a key. God gave us something to take care of us. Are we going to give it to others? He expects us to. When we study Elijah and Elisha, we see these little bullet points. One godly man or woman can make a difference. Are you that man or woman? Am I that man? God is always there to help. He's always there to protect us. So we need to appreciate what God can do. So go serve, go work, go defend the truth, go be faithful, go resist the devil, go further the work of God. That all came from the sermons from these two men and from the book. We all face problems. We all have issues that are going to confront us, things that discourage us. But one thing I wrote down, I believe it's in one of Russ's sermons, and I, I, it, this is not a quote verbatim, but, but I used this for a young lady that came to me, and she said she was struggling, her and her husband, and I told her that, and she asked me if Job said it. I said, no, no, it was, it's just something that you can pick up from studying God's Word. And that is, confident faith looks at bad circumstances and says God is on his throne. He is in control. And as the book of Revelations tells us, he wins. So I will come through what I'm going through now because my home's in heaven. It's not about here, it's about there. So I'm fixing to go to work for the Lord. Write that down and put it on your dashboard or your car, on your refrigerator. I will come through anything because it's not about here. It's about there. Then Esther, when we, we, we studied about Esther, the circumstances of life does not determine who we are or what God may have planned for us. Have you thought about and reflected on your own life and what God's done for you? How God has kind of guided you providentially to where you are today? I can look back and I see that. 
And I see the times that I have disappointed him. The times I have disappointed myself and my family. But God still loves me. And he's provided a way back to him. We need to appreciate God's people, says Esther. And show preference and honor to God's people. We have a family here. We need each other. She would also say, stand up and be courageous. Don't back down. She went before that king knowing she could die. And that's the things Esther said to us. Are we listening? Then John the Baptist. And I didn't take all of them. Please understand, we're not going to spend all 15 of them here. We're going to just do a few The parents told him as a child what was expected of him. But he had to make the choice to do what God expected. He wasn't forced to do what he did. He did it because he chose to. Now the key is, the lesson we need to get from that is, do we listen or do we tell our kids what God expects of them? Do we tell them that the choice that they make has eternal consequences. But John the Baptist also, you know, he had a great following of people. Vast numbers of people came to him. There was a temptation of pride there. But John knew his place. He was humble. We need to decide we are not anything special. We are only a servant of our God. John would say to us, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And Peter, Peter is my favorite one because I identify with Peter much more than John the Baptist or Esther. But I identify with, I think we all do. The first thing he would say was we need to be honest with the evidence that God has given us. Peter saw evidence that could not be Denied. We have the same evidence. Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19, we have the prophetic word confirmed. We see everything that's happened since the beginning of time all the way through the end of Revelation. That's what this book is about. We see everything that happened. And we see testimony to the effect that it was true. John said it. God said it. What are we going to do with it? You're going to have to stand up and stand out, Peter said. He said, gird up your loins. Brace yourself for what's coming. And what you're going to face. Peter said, be holy. Be holy. Get ready. Why? Because you were redeemed by the precious blood of the Son of God. Peter also said, and this is the main thing that I picked up from that. We are defined by our response to Jesus, not by our mistakes. And I thank God for that. You need to thank God for that because we all mess up. We're not perfect, but we must press on to perfection. Apollos, not everyone can do the same thing. You remember that story. Speak your conviction. Know it. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that lies within you. We have heard that numerous times from this pulpit. Can you do that? Can you defend your faith? But Apollos would also say, tell us, you you, you never quit learning. And being fervent doesn't make you right. And it matters what you believe. So be open-minded. When you quit learning, it's when they throw dirt in your face. And some of the best, not the best, but some of the really, really good lessons we had too was from Jacob. Uh, 
Hudgens, remember the, 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 the lessons from Psalms? Serving God is about coming back to him after I've messed up. Because we're going to mess up. We've said that already. First John chapter 1 talks about you know, the fact that if we, if we repent, if we come to him in prayer, ask him for forgiveness, he's just to forgive us for those sins. The blood of Jesus continually cleanses us from the sins and the mistakes that we make. Also from that study we saw, I saw, don't forget what it's like, it's like to be broken. We've all been broken. We're still broken. We're being fixed, but we're still broken. But there are people out there that are broken. And what are we doing to help them get fixed? And, 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 and the one that really stood out to me was, fill me with fire where I once burned with shame. Sin is shameful. It's deceitful, Hebrew chapter 3 tells us. And it separates us from our God, Isaiah 59, chapters one, uh, verses 1 and 2. So fill me with the fire where I once burned with shame. Fire to tell everybody about what Jesus has done for them. God always provides room for me with new hope. God has filled my life with good. There is good in my life because God put good here on this earth. And he wants us to enjoy it. Solomon talked about that. But it's not the end all be all. I wrote this and then after I wrote it, I had other things come to my mind. So I'm having to flip back and forth because I put them on other pages of the book. The other thing, and I guess the last thing we might have picked up from the Psalms is worship is something we give, not something we get. We give our worship to our God because he's deserving of that worship. Because of what he's done for each of us and what he continues to do for each of us. And then just a few weeks ago or maybe a month or so ago, Nehemiah and, and the building of the wall. He prayed. And he would tell us, pray for this congregation. Pray for the work that we have to do that's before us in 2024. Focus on the work. Face the obstacles that you're going to face. And don't get distracted. We're all going to have distractions. Illness, jobs, financial burdens and responsibilities or, or struggles. Our kids and their activities, they all distract us. But Nehemiah would tell us, be determined. Start working on the wall. God has a will and has made it possible for me to know that will. Are we going to accept it or reject it? Whose will am I seeking? God reigns. Are we going to bow before him? Jesus is our king. Devin is always calling him King Jesus. And that's what he is. He bears the name of God. Yet, the studies we've had in Philippians chapter 2, he emptied himself. If so, how much more should we empty ourselves? And serve one another. Take on the servant mentality. How we view difficulties in this world needs to be seen with eternal perspective. Don't listen to the words or to the wrong voices, the words of the wrong voices. Don't make it about you, make it about God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 9 through 11, therefore we we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Well, are we telling them anything? Are we telling them that Christ is coming? That resurrection is coming? That change is coming, 1 Corinthians 15. That victory is coming, Revelation chapter 22. 
we can know that if we die, heaven is ours. Not because we have done everything perfectly, but because Jesus has paid the price for us. I'm not justified because I am perfect. It's because of who God is. How am I going to accept that? How am I going to respond to what God has done for me? Mary and Martha, don't get distracted again. Uh, spiritual things are more important than temporal things. Real faith is a confident faith. You either trust or you don't. It needs to be none but in God, our trust. And trust in God is a choice that we make based on the evidence that we're given. And this one came from one of the lessons that I think Rusk presented. Listen to God's word. Only way that we're going to grow is if I, may, if I become more familiar with that word. What does that tell us? We get 92 lessons up here. We get 24 from us outside. We get Bible study. That's not enough. Read your Bible. Going forth in 2024, make that number one. Read your Bible. For the, book to, for the body to be successful, the whole body has to be intact. What am I doing or what am I supplying to this group of people? We all have something we can do. We need strong, and this came from Devin. We need strong resolve to stick to his word. Never budge. We must be unshakable. And the book doesn't change because God, the author of it, never changes. The sacrifice of Jesus is important because life is short. Death is sure and judgment is coming. We need Jesus. It's appointed that a man wants to die and after that, the judgment. The question becomes, are we ready? If we're not, we need to get ready because as the song said, morning or night or noon. We don't know when. He didn't know when. Only the Father knew. So these are just a few of the things that, 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 that stuck out to me. There were a lot more, and we could spend hours here talking about all the other things. Now, allow as we face a, a, a new year, we're going to hear from, as I've already mentioned, 14 more uh, they being dead uh, yet speak. And, and we're going to have six more men come in from out of the area that are going to speak to us with 24 different lessons on different subjects. We're going to have Russ and, and Devin and possibly somebody else in the congregation that presents some 92 more lessons from God's Word. We're going to have our Bible studies in our, our, uh, here and in the back. Uh, the question becomes, what are we going to do with all that? We're going to get the appetizer. We're going to give it to you. The elders will make sure that we are fed or we're going to get the, the right things to build on. But it can't stay there. So what are we going to do? How are we going to, to, to go into 2024 and, and, and make ourselves better? Each year we all have New Year's resolutions. We all make them. Then after a month or so, maybe not even that long sometimes, uh, we forget them, or, or we just let them go away. We vacate them. With the time left, I, I, I would like to suggest some things that we do every day. Not, not, not long-term goals that, that we struggle with to keep focused in our minds, but something that we do every day to help us be better spiritually in, in 2024. The main thing is, li listen, listen, listen to those of old. Research what they have said, study it, meditate upon it, and build on it. You got to remember, they had a different relationship with God. They, 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 they saw things before them. We, 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 we work everything on faith. But we have evidence that proves that faith. So hunger and thirst after righteousness and you will be filled. 
So, first, if you want to write these down, fine. If you want to listen to the recording, you can do that. Each day, I will thank God for another day of life. Just to be alive today is an incomparable blessing that we should never, ever take for granted and should never neglect to recognize the giver and the sustainer of all life. We need to spend that one day that we're given. One day. We can do anything for one day. We need to spend that day preparing for the last day. Jesus is coming soon. Life is a vapor. It appears for a little while, and it vanishes away. James chapter 4, verse 14. Psalm chapter 19, verse 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. So today, number two, today I'll observe the, the, the wonders of nature as I go about my daily duties. The sky, the birds, the trees, the grass, the flowers, the very air that I breathe, they cry out to us and they become to us make us constantly conscious of a power greater than any of us. A power in whom we live and move and have our very being, Acts chapter 17, verse 28. So let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. So today I will rejoice in the privilege of of communicating with that power. He talks to me. Not in some whispering voice, not in some dream. He talks to me through the word, through his book, through his word that he left for us. And I talk to him in prayer. And I have the privilege to and we need to imagine the creator of the universe, the, the, the power that, that, that maintains everything in its order. We have a relationship with and we can talk to. We can simply lift up our hearts to him and talk to him anytime, anywhere, and he hears us. We mentioned Wednesday night when we were talking about the introduction to Hebrews. He hears us, but it doesn't necessarily mean he gives us the answer we want, but you can be assured that he hears us. So today I am going to talk with him via prayer, and I'm going to let him talk to me via the Bible. Every day, one day, we can do that. Today, number four, I will live the prayer of the psalmist, Psalms chapter 19, verse, 20, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. So I will take time to examine my priorities, remembering what my Savior told me in Matthew chapter 6. I seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. What's going to absorb my mind, my time, and my efforts tomorrow, today? Will I lay up treasures in heaven? Or will I chase the elusive treasures of life? Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. And number five, today I will be aware that every person I see is a never-dying soul who will spend eternity somewhere. Will I think souls? People are searching. Will I help them to find? We have what they need. Are we going to share it? Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse 35, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. They are already white to harvest. That's what's out there right now. The, the fields are white to har harvest. People are looking. People are searching. And we have what they need. Today, I will remember that time is life. We can save money for the future, but not time. Ben Franklin said, do you love life? Then do not squander time, for that's the stuff life is made of. 
If you spend an hour with someone today, you have given that person a precious gift, a part of your life which can never be replaced. The question becomes, what did you talk about? Did you talk about the fact that they're searching for something that makes their life whole? And you have the answer to that? Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 17. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, taking every opportunity of the time that you're given because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Take advantage of the time every day to serve God. To expose to the dying world that we have around us the hope that is found only in Christ Jesus. Again, life's a vapor. Here for a while and gone. Each day we can do something. And in conjunction with that, today I will remember that God's work is done through us. We are his ambassadors. We are commissioned to work for a while in this world, and if we don't do the work, it won't get done. Not that God doesn't have the power to get it done, but his, his, his book clearly points out that that's his plan, that we are to produce fruit, that we are to follow in the steps of Jesus. We are to use him as our example. We are a part of that plan. And in Matthew 28, in the Great Commission, that's not only to the apostles, that's to us. Going to all the world, preach the gospel, teaching them what, you, what I've, I've told you, guiding them in the, the ways they need to go. So today I will keep in mind that my Savior has laid upon me the responsibility and the privilege of being light in the world in a world of spiritual darkness. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 and 16. You're the light of the world, salt of the earth. So to be light in the world requires that we be different from what we see around us. And I will remember that I, know I allow Christ to be, when I allow Christ to be the only significant person in my life, my example, my intercessor, my savior, then I will deny myself and I will take up my cross and I will follow him. Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Knowing that he says in Matthew 28, lo, I am with you always even to the end of the world. He is with us every day of our lives. So I will arm myself with the weapons he has given me, Ephesians chapter 6, the whole armor of God, and I will go out every day and do these things. Every day, one day. Number seven, today I will work, I, I will speak a word of encouragement to lift some weary heart. Most people out there are fighting, as we've already mentioned, uphill battles, and a lot of them are losing. They need the sympathetic touch of somebody who cares about them. Jesus came to seek those, or to save those who were sick, the lost, to seek and save the lost. And he, that is our charge, to seek and save those that are lost, those who are fighting these battles, to help them get through these battles. So I will use my hardships and my heartaches to promote spiritual growth in myself and help others get through their problems also. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4 tells us that God of all comfort has comforted us. And he's given that so we can go out into the world and comfort those who need comfort by the comfort that God has given us. And James chapter 1 talks about the trials of this life producing in us patience, being a blessing, really. We need to take those things and we need to use those to, to, to tell the world about us where relief is. And finally, number eight, today I will be fortified and encouraged by the assurance that I have a sure and dependable anchor in the midst of life storms, that I can know God, I can know his truth, and that he will never fail to keep his promises. I will be comforted, strengthened, and motivated by the hope supplied by the promises of the Father and of the Son. John chapter, four, four, John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, talks about 
the Savior saying, in, in my house are many mansions, and I've gone to prepare a place for you. And then he says, I, where I go, you can go. That's a promise. But to do that, we've got to maintain every day these things that I have mentioned. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 4, he talks about there's no tears there. God's going to wipe away all tears. He's going to comfort us. He's going to take care of us. And also in John 14, Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you, leave you desolate, desolate here. I'm going to leave my peace with you. Peace I give you. The peace knowing that I have a relationship with God through him. Peace I know uh, I have knowing that, that, that there is hope. There's, again, it's not about here, it's about there. And I'm laying up my treasures there. And when I get to the end of my life, then that's there for me. I had the opportunity the other day to play pickleball. <laughs> and my wife, for some reason, recorded that. But you know what it did to me? It made me realize I'm 77 years old. I never thought about that. But I'm on the back end of my life. And if I could encourage anybody here, I would tell you, don't waste your time. Don't waste it. I look back and at what God has done for me and how he has blessed me. And I look at the times that I have disappointed him so badly and wonder, why do you care about me? But he does. So going forward in 2024, I'm going to keep uppermost in my mind the words of wisdom by Solomon that was our scripture reading. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be bad. We can't get away with anything, folks. Are you ready to meet your God? So spend this new year getting ready one day at a time, and you'll be successful. If you have a need, would you come as we stand and sing?